This episode of The Curbsiders is available for CME and mock credit through our partnership with the American College of Physicians. ACP members can go to acponline.org forward slash curbsiders and claim their free CME and mock credit. Thank you and enjoy the show. For entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if it's true. We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. Uh, hey, Paul. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying the. <laughs> I like this naturalistic approach we're doing now. This is good. <laughs> it's like where we forget that we're just like sitting here with microphones, and uh, we just recorded for two hours and and uh, got some great content on AFib. But Paul, why don't you tell the audience uh, what this show is about? Sure. I mean, it may feel like they just walked into a conversation between friends, but really, this is an internal medicine, maybe the internal medicine podcast. <laughs> And we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. We do like to get to know our guest a little bit up front. Our guests are uniformly interesting, nay, fascinating people. So if you skip <laughs> past that, I mean, you're sort of tacitly insulting them and really by extension us. So just just listen. Uh, and Stuart's not here, Paul, but uh, Cyrus the Younger, the great Cyrus Askin is with us here. And he's going to tell them uh, what the show's about. Right, Cyrus? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that that flattering introduction. I sure do appreciate it. So really, we had an absolutely um, enlightening, fantastic discussion with Dr. Jim Ferguson um, about atrial fibrillation. We talked about a lot of the high points from kind of uh, initial approach to diagnosis, a little bit about counseling. Uh, and then we uh, rolled into treatment options, talked about ablation, talked about cardioversion, and then tried to get to some of our um, our excellent um, listener questions. So really just a jam-packed, awesome episode, super high yield. Uh, definitely had a great time talking to Dr. Ferguson. I totally agree. So Dr. Jim Ferguson, MD, is a cardiologist from San Antonio, Texas. He has served as an attending cardiologist, cardiology fa uh, fellowship faculty member, and former program director while serving in an academic program all over the last 20 years. His clinical interests are in general cardiology, preventive cardiology, and cardiovascular imaging. He has a love of learning and teaching in medicine and particularly enjoys teaching bedside medicine and cardiovascular physical exam. More recently, Dr. Ferguson has developed an interest in physician well-being, which we talk about a little bit on the show, and he has completed training as a professional coach at the George Mason, at George Mason, <clears throat> I'm saying Mason, uh, and has completed training as a professional coach at George Mason University. He hopes to use his background experience and leadership coaching skills to help physicians thrive reconnect with patients and experience more joy in their professional lives. And uh, I would say he certainly it succeeded in helping me enjoy my professional life because I, I love recording podcasts like this where we get so much great information and I hope you all will feel the same. Pause for pun, something, something, flutter, something palpitations. Skipping, <laughs> there, dropping oh, beats, solid, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So, Jim, the first question we always ask guests is, can you give us a one-liner about yourself and then make sure you include something about yourself that you do outside the world of medicine? Sure. Well, uh, I would say that in many ways, I'm a typical middle-aged American physician who's enjoyed the adventure of a life in medicine for about three decades now. Um, so, in addition to all the usual ups and downs, um, I've been blessed to serve as a husband, um, a father, a military officer, and uh, at one point a cardiology uh, fellowship director. And so I really enjoyed my time as a program director. Uh, when I'm not in the hospital, I like to do anything outside. So fishing, running, cycling, hiking, playing with the dog. Uh, that's where I like to spend uh, the discretionary time that I'm given. And, you know, I guess I'd say I'm passionate about living with purpose and meaning. So those are things that are important to me. And you don't worry about rattlesnakes with all this outdoor stuff you're doing <laughs> in Texas. 
Yes, I do worry very much about rattlesnakes. And this is the time of year when they're moving. So especially this time of year. Uh, but generally, if you uh, leave them alone, they, they usually seem to be nice enough to leave, leave, leave me alone as well. So I, I think I wanted to ask, with your permission, usually I ask a book or, or pin someone down to make them answer a movie question. But for you, going through your biography, I was actually interested in your, your own interest in physician well-being and coaching. And I, I wondered if you would mind talking a little bit about that. Well, well, thank you for that introduction. I'd love to do that. And, you know, one day maybe I could come back and, and, and have a more extended session with you all to, to do that. But, uh, yes, I've developed an interest in uh, physician well-being um, uh, professional uh, fatigue and exhaustion, um, and and all of the um, sort of wave of uh, concern that that's generated um, across many areas of our society, even in the last few years. Um, I've been lucky to uh, attend uh, the leadership uh, coaching for organizational well-being course at uh, George Mason University over the last six months or so. And that's really giving me uh, hopefully an opportunity to kind of launch into um, a bit of a, uh, of, of a side profession in working with physicians to keep them engaged and keep them optimally of use in their chosen specialty. And of course, that also involves working with institutions and as well as individuals. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm looking into ways to help other physicians in that realm. And I think that's really something that's important in order to keep people in it for the long run. Oh, that's fantastic. Jim, I was curious. I mean, I know you've had a very long career in medicine and, and in the military as well. Of all the different jobs you've had from your very first job up until now, was one of them far and away your favorite? Yeah, I think I think that's an easy question for me to answer, Cyrus. Uh, for me, the, the most fun job that I've ever had, medical or otherwise, has got to be ranch work. Um, <laughs> I grew up in South Texas, and I spent lots of time working on a ranch. And uh, I loved everything about it. I loved being outdoors. I loved working with my hands. I loved caring for large animals and working cattle and riding horses. And I found the entire uh, um, condition very satisfying. And I'd be happy to uh, get back to that one day. But yeah, absolutely. That's that's uh, that was the most <laughs> fun I've ever had. That was not what I was expecting, but that's incredible. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing that. Sure. So to all you kids out there, uh, don't go into medicine, uh, become a ranch hand. <laughs> right. I think they, they actually make, make songs about that. If you, if you listen to the right kind of music, so. there are not many good songs about doctors. <laughs> I, I can, I can <laughs> That's true. Uh, I think we should move in cause we, this is a, a monster of a script. So I think we should really move into uh, a case here so we can start talking about AFib. So uh, we have a great case here from Cashlack Memorial, and it's the case of Mr. Kent Bachman, who's a 68-year-old male with longstanding hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and obesity with a BMI of 33, who's presenting to his PCP for an annual physical. During the review of systems, he mentions a few periods of time over the last year when he's felt palpitations. During these periods, he cannot recall whether he had any chest pain or chest tightness, but he does say they lasted for maybe hours. Uh, and were associated with some increased fatigue and maybe even a bit of lightheadedness. He's not sure if his heart rate was regular during the time or not, and currently denies any symptoms whatsoever. On chart review, you're able to dig up an EKG from a few months ago and notice that he had a little bit of LVH, but otherwise normal sinus rhythm. So I think a good place to start um, for this patient who's uh, concerned about maybe some palpitations would be, what's the most appropriate cost conscious way to approach him? Um, and then could this presentation be consistent with atrial fibrillation? Yeah, of course, palpitations are frequently benign. They're extremely common. And all of your listeners will see patients and do see patients on a regular basis, I would think, with palpitations. Um, they are, again, frequently benign, particularly in those that do not have evident structural disease. There are rare cases of ion channel disorders, but most patients with structurally normal hearts have a favorable prognosis and they really do not warrant uh, 
extensive evaluation. Uh, this patient has a number of factors that point to the presence of structural disease and raise the risk of a more substantial arrhythmia associated with palpitations, um, including possible atrial fibrillation. His risk factors include history of hypertension, obesity, and what we're told is an abnormal electrocardiogram with left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, in addition to the initial evaluation with history, important physical exam findings uh, would include elevation of the jugular venous pulse, uh, evidence of volume overload, uh, a murmur, or an extra heart sound, such as an S3 or an S4. Um, his initial evaluation should include echocardiography and an ambulatory monitor. I think the other question you asked was about uh, certain elements in his presentation that would raise concern for atrial fibrillation. And um, as I mentioned, atrial fibrillation is most commonly associated with, with structural disease or established cardiovascular disease, especially diseases that tend to produce increases in left atrial pressure uh, and result in left atrial enlargement. And that's kind of the central pathologic feature of patients, most patients, that is, with atrial fibrillation. So his history of hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy make such disease actually quite likely. They raise suspicion for diastolic dysfunction and at least intermittent elevations of left atrial pressure, which would lead to left atrial enlargement and ultimately to atrial fibrillation. Um, another important risk factor in this setting is the patient's obesity. It's now widely recognized as a risk factor for atrial fibrillation, but it's also important because it has a role in the treatment of this condition as well. When patients improve their fitness and decrease weight, they tend to have a lower burden of atrial fibrillation and do better with their atrial fibrillation over the long run. I think that's a huge point too. It's something that maybe we don't appreciate as much as primary care providers. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something where I think given the rapport we hopefully have established with our patients, we might actually have the best luck at, uh, at making a change in, in that regard. Jim, I wanted to ask this. So this patient here said there's been a few episodes over the last year. So let's say instead of putting them on like a 24 or 48 hour monitor, we're going to put them on a heart monitor for a month, hope, hoping we catch some AFib. And this question comes up all the time. Like if someone has 30 seconds of AFib over a month, like, does that matter? Or should we just be looking at like something else and, and using that to determine like if we're going to treat it, if we're going to call this AFib? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, of course, we don't really have a, a very distinct and specific answer for that particular question. As we get more and more ways to extend monitoring times with new medical devices, and even now wearable devices that are marketed direct to consumer, we're going to see more and more atrial fibrillation and not just hours of atrial fibrillation, but minutes and seconds of atrial fibrillation. And we're going to have to decide as a, uh, you know, as a, as a medical profession, where what we decide is a disease we call atrial fibrillation and, and, and what, how much of an atrial fibrillation burden is there required to have implications on cardiovascular health and adverse outcomes, including stroke. And uh, there's lots of investigation going on in that area these days. One particularly rich source of that is from cardiac implanted electrical devices where patients are essentially being monitored 24 seven. And a number of investigators are looking at what it means to have these atrial high rate events of a few seconds um, or a few minutes in the grand scheme of things. And we're starting to get a little bit of a better understanding. I think, you know, um, again, I don't have any very specific data that I think is pointing to any sweeping conclusions about this point. But I think the answer today is probably at least six minutes of sustained atrial fibrillation and, and up to 24 hours. The break point is probably in there for what we consider um, prognostically important atrial fibrillation. Patients that have lesser amounts of atrial fibrillation have been associated with increased risk for stroke in some isolated studies. And we, we know that when patients start to have shorter bursts, that frequently when you follow them longitudinally, uh, 
you see that eventually they start to develop longer bursts. So certainly any any detected atrial fibrillation is probably cause for, you know, relatively close follow-up. Um, but when to pull the trigger on, say, the anticoagulant or things like that, I think it's, unfortunately, I think it's too early to tell. Mm-hmm. So I think we should I think we should bring it back to our case here and just make sure that we kind of summarize what we've talked about so far. So this is a 68 year old guy. He's got risk factors. You you listed them: hypertension, obesity. He has LVH on his EKG. So there's it's very plausible that someone like this would have atrial fibrillation. Um, so it sounds like in in his case, uh, we are gonna we're gonna probably believe that this this could be that, and we're gonna we're, we're gonna do a heart monitor here. So, um, Cyrus, do you want to take us into the next part of the case and sort of the next, next few questions? Yeah. So I think maybe right off the bat, one question would be in addition to that, um, that heart monitoring, um, you know, oftentimes I've been told, well, we need to order thyroid function tests, renal function panel, check a CBC, maybe just go ahead and get an echo. So is there, um, I'm, I'm sure that in your practice, there's a certain um, like rhyme or reason to what you order and when you order it. Could you uh, walk us through that kind of briefly and, and let us know what should we order right off the bat and then what can maybe wait until later? Sure. So once we've established that the patient does indeed have atrial fibrillation, then um, I typically, um, in addition to the physical exam and the resting electrocardiogram, will perform a chest X-ray if I have any suspicion for pulmonary disease or heart failure. And I, I do agree that a, a relatively limited uh, laboratory investigation that includes thyroid testing, renal function profile, liver tests, and a blood count should be performed. Um, that also has implications on, say, initiating anticoagulation and things like that that may come. So that's part of the reason that we're doing that additional evaluation. And yes, I think that essentially all adult patients that have atrial fibrillation uh, should have an echocardiogram. As we've mentioned, there are patients that have what we used to call lone atrial fibrillation, which is essentially atrial fibrillation in the absence of any cardiovascular or structural disease. But for the most part, atrial fibrillation should be thought of as as a disease of structural cardiovascular abnormalities and underlying disease. And so because of that, uh, we should have some suspicion for structural disease and performing an echocardiogram to look for um, the the myriad of associated cardiovascular conditions that contribute to atrial fibrillation, I think is important. And then finally, um, again, these days with the types of patients that typically present with atrial fibrillation, you will frequently find risk factors and a a relatively substantial overlap with sleep apnea. And so if patients with atrial fibrillation uh, have risk factors or signs and symptoms of sleep apnea, then I think a sleep study is important, again, because of the uh, importance of using um, a therapy for sleep apnea in the treatment of atrial fibrillation when it's present. Excellent. And it's all come full circle back to the uh, sleep apnea episode that I uh, helped produce. So that's, that's fantastic. I could, couldn't have worked out better. Um, yeah. what, one other question that I did have kind of um, along, uh, along those lines of like, you know, making the diagnosis, preparing the patient for, um, for potential therapy. So suppose Mr. Bachman here said, you know what, it's just some palpitations. It's, you know, it's not a big deal. It doesn't bother me all that much. Um, how would you go about counseling uh, Mr. Bachman and, and telling him, well, you know, actually it is kind of a big deal. Um, and then uh, kind of, you know, just really um, trying to, in a patient, through a patient centered sort of approach, um, get him to buy into to therapy. Yeah, I think that's important because as we've already mentioned, you know, patients can have a wide spectrum of symptoms with their atrial fibrillation and frequently have no symptoms. And so, trying to um, uh, convince the patient or get their uh, cooperation with treatment, I think is really important. So I usually inform patients that atrial fibrillation tends to cause two major issues that most of the other things basically stem from. And the first is it tends to create tachycardia, makes your heart go too fast. And now that's not always the case, and that depends on the status of the conduction system. But most patients with atrial fibrillation are going to be bothered 
by the elevated heart rate that tends to accompany that condition. And that in turn becomes a potential source for cardiomyopathy and and that typically is reversible with good rate control. So that's that's why it's incumbent upon us to be aware of the atrial fibrillation and to get that heart rate controlled because you know, as I tell patients, that can weaken your heart muscle and lead to heart failure. Um, the other big issue, of course, is the risk for stroke. And I try to inform patients that whether they feel their atrial fibrillation or not, if it's present there for a significant amount of time, then again, whether they feel it or not, it continues to be a risk factor for stroke. And unfortunately, some patients present with stroke um, without really ever getting the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation beforehand. So I think uh, informing patients and simply telling them that when, you know, using this illustration that when, when, when you have atrial fibrillation, I tell patients their, their top chambers are no longer beating rhythmically and helping to move blood meaningfully through the heart during the cardiac cycle. And as a result, when blood pools in those top chambers and starts to swirl around and isn't moving effectively, then it gets stagnant and stagnant blood tends to clot. And so this condition leads can lead to a situation where you can create a clot inside your heart that if it gets back in the bloodstream can be ejected uh, into the brain and cause a stroke. And so that uh, most patients tend to identify with that. And, and, and that's usually um, a pretty good intro into helping create some awareness and the, I would say the proper level of concern that is attendant to this condition for patients. I want to go back to the workup if, just for a second, Matt, if that's okay with you. I actually, I, I realizing that atrial fibrillation is driven largely by structural heart disease still. And sometimes in the workup of it, I see a lot of enthusiasm for an ischemic workup. So either stress mm -hmm. testing, um, as, as a potential trigger. I'm just wondering, is there a, a specific role for that in particular patients or what's sort of the general consensus about them? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Paul. And, uh, that's interesting. You know, if we listed all the causes of atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease would actually be pretty low on the list. Now yeah. in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, where you've got particularly a large, frequently, right-sided infarction going on and you have lots of myonecrosis, the abrupt hemodynamic changes can sometimes produce atrial fibrillation, acute atrial fibrillation. And when that occurs, that that's actually a group of patients that's having, you know, large uh, heart attacks and they have a poor prognosis. But in general, um, I don't think atrial fibrillation I don't think there's a lot of cause and effect between atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease. Instead, you're talking about two conditions that are actually very common um, in the population. They actually have a lot of the same risk factors and they kind of run together. And so uh, particularly as patients get older, I mean, age is probably the strongest risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And it's probably the strongest risk factor for coronary artery disease. And so you frequently find these diseases running together, but just because someone had atrial fibrillation does not mean they have ischemic heart disease. And so um, I think as a cardiologist, I'm always on the lookout for coronary artery disease. And I'm always, <laughs> sure. I'm always looking for that opportunity to run testing for ischemic heart disease. Um, and I think that I, I bring that same level of concern to patients that have palpitations or atypical chest pain and to some extent atrial fibrillation. But I don't think that the first that the, the first few diagnoses that are on the top of your head when you see a patient with atrial fibrillation should be ischemic heart disease. I think that is is not necessarily cause and effect. Now, if patients describe chest pain, that obviously needs to be investigated and and uh, but again, um, I think the the point here is that you have two conditions that tend to be common in the population, but we don't see a lot of cause and effect between those two. Does that make sense? A hundred percent, Jim. So we we should move on to treatment because there are a ton of questions <laughs> uh, among among this part, and and if something relevant comes up, we can always go back to some of the the diagnostic stuff. But I guess maybe this is a good point to why don't we try to do a recap here of what we learned? So basically. We assessed this guy for risk factors. We did an EKG. It was abnormal. We were going to get an echo on him. 
this this gentleman probably is at risk for sleep apnea, so we might consider a sleep study, especially if he gives us a history there. And then the basic lab workup is like thyroid function, and we're going to check the kidney, the liver function. I can't remember if you said you also get an initial coag. Um, not routinely. If I was going to start an anticoagulant, I probably would. So that's so that's pretty much the workup, and and then as far as cardiac monitors go. Um, I feel like that could be a whole nother episode unto itself. (laughs) So we'll just say, uh, you select an appropriate cardiac monitor, uh, (laughs) and you find AFib. So in this gentleman now, uh, we're going to be talking about, we got to talk to him about anticoagulation, rate control, rhythm control. So Jim, where would you start with this gentleman? We've just diagnosed him with paroxysmal AFib. Okay, great. And, and so, uh, again, I do think it's, a, it's wise not to dwell too long on exactly how much AFib you have to have, but I also think it's safe to say we're talking about minutes to hours of sustained atrial fibrillation. And so now we're all comfortable with the idea that this guy's got, you know, honest to goodness atrial fibrillation. And so, okay, so let's move out. Yeah, so I think your question was kind of about initial treatment um, of the patient with, um, in this case, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So um, again, initially, I typically discuss the option of management with the patient. And we're talking about that initial decision about rate control versus a rhythm control strategy. And, And then, of course, it's also important right at the outset to discuss the patient's risk of stroke, their risk of anticoagulation, and to identify patients that have indications for anticoagulation and to initiate anticoagulation in patients that have acceptable bleeding risk, probably, I would say, in, in, a, um, in a process of shared decision making. I think that's really important because even though we think anticoagulation has strong benefit, it's also one of the riskiest medications that we probably prescribe. And so we need patients to be motivated and educated, and we need them to understand the risks and benefits of their of their treatment decisions uh, in this particular case. Uh, I think it's really important. So um, what to do about rate versus rhythm control? Well, um, I was fortunate to help out with the AFFIRM trial, which was uh, an NIH-sponsored trial that was done in multi-centers in what, the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, it gave, and this was a randomized trial of rate versus rhythm control in patients with atrial fibrillation. And kind of uh, working with those patients, I think it gave me a bit of a unique perspective to share with the patients. Because in my experience, um, we found that durable rhythm control, and this is before the age of ablation. I'm sure we're going to be talking about that. But at least in the era of antirhythmic drugs without ablation, durable rhythm control was really pretty difficult to maintain. And it seemed like the patients that got randomized to rhythm control were frequently getting admitted for cardioversions or loading new drugs and things like that. And, and they really didn't seem to have a lot of obvious benefit. And of course, in the, in the final analysis, the hard endpoints in the AFFIRM trial were similar between the two groups. And so I think what most people take from that was that there was really no mandate to seek rhythm control primarily in order to maintain some kind of uh, superior outcome. And, and so really, if that's the case, then, then I think it's extremely important to individualize the decision and to understand that individual patients will vary in their need for us to produce normal rhythm. Uh, for frequently, patients come in, and many of, of your listeners have seen these patients. They, it's, you know, they have atrial fibrillation on their EKG that was a surprise to them. It was a pr- surprise to us. We go back, even when we have the diagnosis in hand, we really can't dis- discern any specific symptoms. And it's really hard to make a, a strong case for rhythm control in that population of patients. They simply just don't have a lot of symptom um, burden to be relieved by maintaining normal rhythm, uh, particularly if you get good rate control. Um, frequently, good rate control is really how you control symptoms with atrial fibrillation. Now, that being said, on the other end of the spectrum, there are a group of patients who are extremely symptomatic with atrial fibrillation, even when their ventricular rate is well controlled. And those patients stand to benefit immensely in terms of their well being and sometimes in their functional status by restoring sinus rhythm. So, so I think that 
you know, making a decision with the patient about this is really dependent on uh, to what level the patient is suffering from their atrial fibrillation with regard to their symptoms. And so I think that uh, is really how we guide that initial um, approach. That's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't say anything about uh, assessing stroke risk in, in particular, but of course, uh, that's something that needs to be done. Um, as soon as we know we're dealing with the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, uh, most of your listeners are going to be familiar with the chads 2 vas score, which I think now is pretty much considered the standard way to assess stroke risk. And there are very specific recommendations from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, Heart Rhythm Society guidelines about about who stands to benefit from anticoagulation with regard to their CHADS2 VAS score. So that needs to be done. And then finally, before a decision is made for anticoagulation, uh, there should be an assessment of the patient's bleeding risk. And, uh, and then, again, this decision to anticoagulate in patients when it's recommended in this process of shared decision-making. I wanted to just go back to the FIRM trial that the the two arms were they were studying it was a heart rate of 80 was this sort of strict rate control versus less than 110 for a resting heart rate was the uh was the le- lenient rate control is that was that yeah I, I think you may be referring to the race trial okay um the the in the affirm trial that came before the race trial and i think in that group we were aiming for uh a resting heart rate of less than 80 which was kind of the traditional uh Oh, yeah. uh, Wisdom there. In the race trial, um, that was a that trial was specifically um, designed to look at differences in outcome between patients that had the strict what they considered strict rate control of a heart of a resting heart rate less than 80 80 versus uh, those with a resting heart rate less than 110. And in that particular study, there was no um, significant difference between lenient versus strict rate control for hard uh, endpoints. There's a lot of um, that. That study kind of st- stands alone. There's a lot of criticism about that. One of them being that uh, patients with heart rate in, in the in the lenient heart rate control, many of them actually had strict heart rate control by their their criteria. So there was a bit of overlap there, and there wasn't two very distinct groups. And even today, when you read the guidelines, you'll find that there's a class 2A indication for strict rate control with a goal of heart, a resting heart rate less than 80 and kind of a 2B indication for that option for the lenient rate control in patients that were shooting for less than 110. It sounds like if you can get it less than 80 pretty easily, then, you know, it's, it's, it almost reminds me of blood pressure. Like right, if, yeah. you can get, if you get <laughs> exactly. it less than 130 pretty easily, then, you know, it's not that's a right. big deal. Then you're good. Yeah, that's, that's really true. I mean, when, when your patients, when you can't get your patient to less than 80, you kind of start talking about the race trial, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're like, you know, I can't get them less than 105. I'm going to have to call it a day, you know, so I'm going to quote the race trial and move on. Yeah. So I was mixed. Yeah. I was combining two trials in my head. So the, so the affirm was rate versus rhythm looking at hard endpoints. And then race was just looking at rate control and how strict does it need to be? That's correct. Sorry, I can't Robert. imagine how you do that. I mean, there's only like a couple <laughs> cardiology studies out there. No, you know? I mean, I, I have flashcards. Paul knows about this. Every night, <laughs> me in the cardiology trials. Yeah. So I actually, I mean, that reminds me of a question, and maybe this is getting to like a listener type question or something, but I think it, it fits in well here. So as as internists, I mean, we're all internists um, uh, here. As internists, we typically will reach for rate control first. Um, and maybe that's because we're more familiar with it or we feel that the side effects are fewer generally. You know, we go through medical school and we learn the the dogma surrounding amiodarone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so typically we're reaching for rate control first. A lot of times it's a metoprolol or a carvetolol. Um, but um, at what point, if ever, uh, do you feel the internist should entertain dual AV nodal blockade with a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker? Or at that point, should we be thinking of a rhythm control strategy or sending them on to, to see you in the cardiology clinic? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I agree with the general approach about a rhythm control or excuse me, a rate control strategy initially. 
Um, as a fellow internist and a cardiologist, I agree with with that. And and I think that that's a an excellent way to go. The antiarrhythmic drugs um, do have side effects, as you know. They have a relatively narrow therapeutic index. They require careful selection. They have lots of, uh, I would say, inclusion and exclusion criteria. There are multiple drug interactions that have to be constantly monitored for many of these drugs. And these patients require pretty close follow-up. And so that may not be something you want to do in your primary care practice. And if not, then yes, you should refer those patients to your cardiologist. Um, and um, I think that um, that generally the rate control strategy is, is good. Should you use a second um, antidromotropic drug or rate controlling drug, if you're uh, not getting adequate results with your initial drug, uh, that's uh, that's a, a reasonable approach as long as you're cautious about the risk for bradycardia. And um, one one maybe one pearl here is that the the a rhythm control strategy is always acceptable when you're not getting good results with your rate control strategy. So if that be the fact that you're 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 having unacceptable side effects or you're not getting success with adequate rate control, yes, that's a good time to think about uh, switching over to rhythm control. Uh, for patients that have persistent symptoms, that's a good time. For patients that have LV dysfunction and heart failure, I think we're starting to get a little bit more of a sense that that may be kind of a subgroup of patients where at least exquisite rate control is very important, if not a rhythm control uh, strategy as a preference. And possibly even, and I say possibly, even um, a, a, uh, an ablation-oriented uh, approach. There's some data that's coming out that suggests there may be some superiority there. Yeah, the uh, the ablation. We we were planning on bringing this up at some point. I think it was this January in the annals. There was the the paper looking at uh, ablation for patients with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I believe it was, and showing maybe there's a benefit in mortality and decreased hospitalizations. So I I wonder if that's gonna be incorporated. I know there were guidelines that were recently updated kind of around the same time. So I'm not sure if that was incorporated yet or if that's just going to be maybe in the in the up next update. Yes, actually there was an updated guideline from the ACC AHA HRS for atrial fibrillation in uh, February of this year and they do speak to that. Uh, they also quote the studies that you're mentioning. Uh, Castle AF was was one of them in particular that was a randomized controlled trial of radiofrequency ablation vis versus conventional therapy, which could either be rate or rhythm control in patients that had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and were not considered candidates for antiarrhythmic drugs. And in, in this particular study, the radiofrequency ablation group actually had lower mortality, decreased admissions for heart failure, and an improved ejection fraction. Um, and so that was pretty compelling, and that's really started a lot of discussion about that. Uh, this was a relatively small study. I think the current recommendation for um, radiofrequency ablation in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, again, uh, was in the latest uh, update to the guidelines. And I think it's given a class 2B indication, kind of an optional but acceptable. Uh, we may need to check that. Um, to make sure we've got that right. But it's either a 2A or a 2B. I think it was 2B. The other thing that stands a little bit in distinction to that is the larger Cabana trial that was uh, released within the last year. It was, again, a larger study in a general population of atrial fibrillation patients. Only about 9% of those patients had cardiomyopathy. And it also had a relatively extended follow-up period of about five years. And in that study, there was no superiority of the radio frequency ablation over medical therapy for these hard cardiovascular endpoints that we mentioned. So I think there's mixed data on that question. I think that that's being really pretty actively investigated. We are starting to see a few recommendations make it into the guidelines, and it's definitely an area that we're going to want to watch. And when you think about who to refer 
for radio frequency ablation. I think those are patients that when you identify, you probably do want to get some expert evaluation to think about that. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like if if rate control doesn't work, uh, then we're probably sending them to cardiology. And but it's good for us to know sort of how y'all are thinking and what's evolving, uh, so we understand like how you how you make the choice who gets ablation, who gets tried on antiarrhythmia and uh, yeah, rhythm control. It it sounds complicated. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, it is a little bit complicated. You know, atrial fibrillation is interesting. It's very common, and it, at the at the at one level, it seems very simple and and cut and dried and straightforward. But when you start taking care of patients, you realize there's an enormous amount of nuance. And there's despite all the data and the multiple studies and and the really the pretty specific guidelines, there's still lots of gray areas. There's lots of different ways to manage these patients. And, um, and so, yeah, that, I guess that's what makes it interesting. Matt and I were talking before the episode started and actually I, I, I had heard that every one of your patients with atrial fibrillation is owed at least one visit with an electrophysiologist. And I think that probably more because there is so much nuance. And I think also some of the, the newer data coming out, I guess, to your mind, are there any particular groups of patients with atrial fibrillation that you think sort of merit? Certain, not a, an automatic, but should merit more heavily consideration for referral to electrophysiology or cardiology? Yeah, well, certainly patients that are highly symptomatic, um, patients that you think would be good patients for radiofrequency ablation. Again, we just talked about the heart failure population. Uh, the other group of patients is actually kind of the other end of the spectrum. These are the patients with a little or no structural disease that are usually younger, they're vigorous. Sometimes they're actually extremely vigorous individuals that are these ultra marathon athletes and and have t- kind of taken the exercise piece to the nth degree. And it turns out that you ex- actually can exercise enough to induce atrial fibrillation. And so some of these types of, of athletes that have enormous athletic endeavor going on and that have had a lot of, of adaptation of their cardiovascular system to exercise typically have extremely high levels of resting vagal tone. They tend to run very bradycardic, particularly at night when they're sleeping. And they may be waking up at night with palpitations that are from atrial fibrillation. They don't really have any evident structural disease frequently, but they can certainly be bothered by their symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And this group of patients tends to benefit from radiofrequency ablation um, and and typically have much higher rates of cure and better long-term outcomes. And so when I see patients like that, particularly if they don't want to take a bunch of medications, which they usually don't, that's another group of patients that I think needs to be referred a little bit earlier in the process in order to uh, kind of kind of get them where they need to be. I want to talk about the choice for anticoagulation and the the guideline that you referenced, the, the newer guideline, something that I wanted to point out to the audience in there. It said that... so. One of the things in the Chad's two vast score is uh, is sex. So so women get a one, they get a one point in that score. And it said that that you should only count that towards a treatment decision if they also have at least one other risk factor. They kind of auto- counted that out. So unless unless a woman had another at least one other point, you wouldn't count this score of one um, and and you know use that as ammunition to go ahead and treat this person, but. Jim, what is your treatment threshold? And and then can you kind of bring us into how you start to think about which anticoagulant you're going to choose? Yeah, so that's a good point about what to do with the, this idea that women have one point right off the bat. And, and it's true that it's not really supposed to be an issue unless there's the presence of a second risk factor. And so the the latest iteration of the guidelines from 2019, and I think we want to make sure and post that for your listeners so that they can see for themselves. But they actually do a pretty nice job of saying that anticoagulation is a class one indication in men with a CHADVAS score of two or greater or women with a score of three or greater. And so now we're specifically identifying men and women as two uh, different um, candidates for anticoagulation with women essentially always um, being given one, uh, one number higher in the decision-making process. So they've already incorporated that into the system as if we look at the the, the most recent iteration of the guidelines. So again, it's a class one recommendation for men with a score of two or greater 
or women with a score of three or greater, for men with a score of one or women with a score of two, anticoagulation is considered optional but acceptable, essentially a class 2B indication. And for men with a score of zero or women with a score of one, it's reasonable to omit anticoagulation. And that's a class 2A indication. So you can see how they've kind of already tried to factor that in with the latest recommendations. Uh, I think you had a question. Uh Sorry, which guideline are you referencing specifically? This is from the the focused update on atrial fibrillation. Got it. Um, but first author is January, and it was published uh, this year, I think February of 2019. Great. Okay. I think that'll be helpful. Jim, can you speak to the choice of, so we, we've done the Chad's 2 vast score for, for our gentleman. His score is greater than two, so we're going to treat him. How would you decide, um, how, how would you decide which agent to use? Okay, that's a great question. And, you know, we have so many choices now. So the, the, the technology and medicine has really advanced in the last decade or so with these direct acting oral anticoagulants that we now have at our disposal. Um, the traditional vitamin K antagonist is now actually considered um, not preferred. And, and so, again, the latest guideline is recommending direct acting oral anticoagulants as preferred agents over vitamin K antagonists for most patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation if they're eligible to take um, one of these newer drugs. Um, I think it's important to remember also that um, they are not indicated in patients that have valvular AFib. And and that's actually been a point of a lot of kind of um, confusion, I think, in the last few years. Like what's valvular AFib and what's non-valvular AFib? Well, um, the again, the latest guideline gives a pretty specific definition. And uh, traditionally, valvular AFib was essentially mitral stenosis that was associated with rheumatic heart disease. And we know that those patients have very high rates of stroke and thromboembolism. And as a result, uh, they were considered essentially a separate group of patients with atrial fibrillation because their thromboembolic risk was so high. And most of these studies using the newer direct acting oral drugs ha- have not included those. And so we, we need to be aware of that and understand that for those patients, they should still be getting a vitamin K antagonist. But for patients that have non-valvular AFib, that is now defined as all atrial fibrillation, except that that, that is associated with moderate to severe mitral stenosis or the presence of a mechanical heart valve, that in those patients, um, the the preference is to give a direct acting oral anticoagulant. And so, and, and I think if you ask patients, as I frequently do, that have been on both um, uh, warfarin and uh, a, a DOAC, they're going to tell you all day that they strongly prefer the newer agents. They're just so much easier to take. They don't require close adherence to dietary restrictions. They have less drug interactions. And of course, they don't require frequent blood monitoring and dose adjustment. And, uh, and so, and, and we're, we're also seeing that the, that when you take all comers, there's comparable or less bleeding risk in the, uh, the, the direct acting oral drugs. And specifically there's less intracranial hemorrhage, which is probably the most feared of the bleeding complications associated with these anticoagulants. And so I think you want to pick, uh, a direct acting oral drug when you have the opportunity to do that in a patient that's eligible for that type of therapy. Um, I think for many of your listeners, they're going to, they're, they may be encountering patients that have difficulty affording these drugs, and that's a real issue. Um, but, you know, when, when it's feasible and it serves the patient otherwise, we should be going for those drugs, I think. So which one do I use? I mean, I typically use a Pixaban. Um, it's what it's on formulary for me. Um, it's uh, readily available. It has probably, um, um, similar, if not lower bleeding risk than some of the others. It has similar, if not better stroke prevention than the others. 
And so uh, that makes it a good drug for me, for patients that can take um, a, a twice daily drug with good adherence. The other choices are also you know, very reasonable. There are not that many cases where one is specifically preferred over another. And so there may be reasons to, to choose one or the other. A lot of times it comes down to something like the patient's renal function. Uh, for patients that have modest um, decrease in renal function, um, a drug like apixaban or a properly adjusted dose of uh, rivaroxaban can be a good choice. And so I try to keep patients inside the safety margins of the different drugs as they're labeled as much as possible. So, for example, a patient who has a, a GFR of 30, um, a, that intermediate or that lower dose of rivaroxaban of 15 milligrams a day, which is approved for patients with a GFR of 15 to 50, seems to be a good fit because then I've got a little bit of safety margin on either side. It, particularly for a patient with regard to apixaban who may be over 80, who has a low, a low body weight, or who has that creatinine that's hovering right around 1.5. And when they get into these kind of gray areas for dosing changes, I try to find sometimes other drugs that provide a little bit more safety margin with regard to their dosing. But in general, they all have some modest drug interactions that we should be aware of. We need to be aware of whether patients are going to comply well with twice a day versus once a day dosing. And we need to think about a lot of the other things that affect their, their ability to take a specific um, direct acting oral drug. So um, that's generally the way I think about it. I would also say that in our particular institution, we're fortunate to have a uh, acumenin clinic, an anticoagulation clinic that uh, happens to track their patients closely and has a very high uh, time and therapeutic range uh, for patients that are on anticoagulation with warfarin. And so I also think that that's a reasonable choice. And I do have patients that have been on warfarin for many years. That's what they like. Um, they had some concerns initially about the con concerns regarding the reversibility of the direct acting oral drugs. And so for a lot of those kinds of reasons, they've chosen to stay on warfarin, at least in my institution, where um, I have the reassurance that we generally have high time and therapeutic range. I also think that's, you know, a reasonable choice. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And it's nice. I, I like how you threw in the renal function tips there as well, because that comes up all the time. And the hopefully it's not just my bias, but I, I feel like the reversal thing, it, it the, these agents are relatively short acting and it's not that many patients that are actually being reversed. And maybe maybe they're going to other services and there's these nightmare stories that I'm missing. I'm sure they're out there, but I feel like the reversal thing is, uh, it, it's, I don't think it's as big a deal as some people make of it. Uh, some patients hear that and they think like they're going to die if they, maybe they don't right. understand they can hold pressure on certain types of cuts and other types of bleeds. We, you, we don't reverse patients on warfarin a lot of the time even. So that's right. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, um, I'm sure that if you talk to the right trauma surgeon, you can hear the story of the, you know, the catastrophe, Yeah. but it's, but you know, these, these drugs have been compared head to head with warfarin and the bleeding risks have been, have been measured and described and if anything, the bleeding risk may be a little lower. So, um, and it's true that these are generally short acting drugs. And um, I agree that why, while the, the availability of a reversal agent is welcomed, um, it may not be as big of an issue as we may have been concerned with initially. I think that's, that's a great summary. And I think it's also important to, um, to know, you know, here at Cashlack, we're, we're very fortunate to have, um, you know, a, a robust anticoagulation clinic, but a lot of places don't have that. And so if you're subtherapeutic on your, um, on your warfarin, it's, you're not really getting the benefit. And then another thing that I think about too is, um, and I think it was the pioneer AF study where we, you know, we, we earlier in our discussion, we talked about how coronary artery disease um, and atrial fibrillation, while maybe not directly related in, in most cases, can occur simultaneously. I think for me, that study was um, maybe another 
um, I don't know how else to put it, nail in the coffin, so to speak, for uh, for vitamin K antagonists in that we can we, we have a mechanism now, an evidence based mechanism to avoid dual antiplatelet therapy in those patients and a vitamin K antagonist. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's another area that's rapidly changing, and, and we are starting to see some changes in the guidelines regarding the use of the so-called triple antithrombotic therapy in patients that are treated with coronary stenting that have concurrent atrial fibrillation, uh, either as part of the treatment for acute coronary syndrome or in the setting of um, stable ischemic heart disease. Um so, yeah, at this point, I think that we've pretty much got the green light for several direct acting oral anticoagulants instead of a vitamin K antagonist and in combination with uh, a drug like clopidogrel um, in terms of preventing both stent thrombosis, uh, recurrent cardiac event, cardiovascular events, and stroke in the patients with atrial fibrillation and coronary stents or after recent ACS. So, yeah, I think that most um, most of us are, are doing that without too much concern. There's a, a bit of a move afoot to give a, a, a relatively short uh, period of triple antithrombotic therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, and an anticoagulant for maybe a month after ACS with stenting, followed by a longer period of dual uh, therapy with uh, a drug like clopidogrel in an anticoagulant. And in some cases, the patients are getting, are getting changed from a triple therapy to dual therapy after four to six weeks. And in some cases, they're going home from the hospital on dual therapy, uh, particularly if they have a carry elevated bleeding risk. Jim, I've seen in, in the practice uh, at CashLack, I've basically seen, it kind of depends on the interventionalist, but if someone's at high bleeding risk, they're going right to the dual therapy. And I guess if somebody has a really high risk for thrombosis, then maybe maybe the risk benefit is more acceptable. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And if your readers want to get the latest recommendations on that, Again, that update uh, from the ACC, AHA, HRS in February of this year uh, for atrial fibrillation talks about that as well. So that's been updated and it's found its way in the guidelines now. One of the last things we wanted to ask you before, maybe we ask you a couple rapid fire questions from social media was going to be about... Let's say this guy, our patient, uh, I believe his name was Kent Bachman. And Cyrus, I'm not sure where he got that name from. Is, it, is he from The Simpsons? It's, I feel like it's a Simpsons character, but I don't know. Dr. Ferguson, uh, do you want to fill yeah. us in? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got it. So that, that was clever. And so, yeah, so there's the bundle of Kent. Uh, and ah, uh, that's yeah. involved in some of the uh, uh, atrioventricular arrhythmias and uh, pre-excitation and things like that. So I'm guessing that's what you were thinking when when you came up with that clever name of Kent Bachman, right? I, yeah, I thought that was course. like the news anchor on The Simpsons. I could have No, <laughs> no. And then, of course, like I like to ask the residents, you know, if they know how um, how um, electrical impulses in the heart are transmitted from um, from right to left. And so that's Bachman's bundle is what I what I talk about uh, there. Um, so really I'm just a huge loser and that's, <laughs> I wouldn't that's say that fine. Cyrus, Cyrus, you've, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, a, you're a chief yeah. resident with his whole life ahead of him. Uh, oh man. Yeah. I so, don't know. Huge nerd, huge nerd. <laughs> okay. Okay. To quote yeah. Spinal Tap, there's a fine line between clever and stupid. And I think <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Well, Perfect. Okay. Yeah, Cyrus, that will play well in your uh, in your interview for a cardiology fellowship. <laughs> yes, I will do pulmonary critical care medicine and then go into cardiology fellowship. Yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, okay, so let's let's get back on the rails here. Uh, let's say this gentleman, Kent Bachman, had had uh, he said he never had palpitations before. All of a sudden, he comes in highly symptomatic, AFib, heart rates in the one forties. Uh, how do we decide if we're going to cardiovert him right away? And uh, can you talk a little bit about cardioversion and what that entails for the patient uh, after the fact, medication-wise? Sure. So, of course, I guess there's always a, an opportunity to talk about emergency cardioversion and indications for that. And it's important to remember that when patients are really unstable with their atrial fibrillation, it's acceptable to perform an immediate cardioversion uh, we talk about that in ACLS, and it's certainly 
uh, can be part of the initial management of patients with atrial fibrillation, particularly those if there's any ventricular pre-excitation going along. If you have a Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome patient that has atrial fibrillation with that really chaotic, sometimes extremely rapid ventricular response that isn't tolerated well, you can get into a lot of trouble with uh, attempting medical therapy in those patients. And uh, you need to either very carefully pick medical therapy for them, or I would say just have a low threshold to cardiovert those patients. And so that's, that's one group of patients where you're, you're going to want to think about cardioversion early and often. Most patients that have atrial fibrillation that um, are, are able to be adequately rate controlled, which would be your initial uh, goal. Um, but there are patients that have things like refractory heart failure, cardiogenic shock, or some kind of refractory hypotension, uh, ongoing ischemia that need uh, prompt restoration of sinus rhythm. And for those patients, it's reasonable to do an immediate cardioversion. It's obviously a synchronized countershock. You do need to be cognizant of the stroke risk in these patients. And, um, And depending on the scenario, you may very well be anticoagulating these patients at the time of their cardioversion um, or immediately after, um, again, depending on a lot of the clinical scenario. But um, that's that's an important uh, thing to remember and to understand. Um, Performing cardioversion in a a little bit of a less acute fashion, perhaps for a patient like you're describing who, who presents with pretty symptomatic and and, and substantially accelerated uh, ventricular rate with their atrial fibrillation. Um, I personally, again, prefer to do rate control initially. Many of these patients will spontaneously cardiovert it if they're watched. And so getting a patient like this on an intravenous uh, drug for rate control, getting them in the hospital, starting some oral beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and just sort of waiting uh, frequently results in return of sinus rhythm. Um, in fact, there's been some studies kind of looking at an initial cardioversion versus kind of a delayed cardioversion for patients that didn't spontaneously cardiovert. And so outcomes are very similar. Um, and, um, and, and, and certainly if you look at like four or six weeks later, you're going to see really similar sort of outcomes. So if you can, if you can delay it without putting the patient any risk, I think that's a good idea. Um, so, again, my general approach is rate control first for patients that are having their initial episode of atrial fibrillation. Um, it's also important in a patient like that to, to think about other uh, issues that, that would require um, additional therapy, such as, you know, does this patient have a pulmonary embolism going on? Do they have heart failure going on? Do they have acute coronary syndrome going on? Is there an exacerbation of lung disease or is there some infection you know, what's, what's brewing behind the atrial fibrillation that's driving that. And so you want to, you want to stop and think about that a little bit and do any indicated investigations. Um, for patients that may, that persist in atrial fibrillation after their admission, um, particularly those that aren't getting good rate control after an overnight stay in the hospital, patients that have some kind of other, maybe they're very symptomatic um, I would frequently, um, and, and for many patients that are having their initial episode of atrial fibrillation, we, we tend to have a lower threshold, I think, to uh, cardiovert those patients because many of those patients will get cardioverted and they may be a year or two, uh, as best we can tell, free of any symptomatic AFib. And so for them, I think that was a useful intervention. And so that's generally how I think about cardioversion with that initial um, um, presentation. And it requires like four weeks post, uh, anticoagulation. Uh, Cause I, I, so yeah. So I think the question is, are there patients who can be cardioverted without a transesophageal echo to evaluate for, um, uh, intracardiac thrombus bef- before the cardioversion? And it really depends on the duration of the atrial fibrillation and the time that they've been on anticoagulation. So for patients with, say, a history of atrial fibrillation that have been taking anticoagulation for months and and who can attest to good adherence to their medical therapy with anticoagulation, then they would not need transesophageal echo to clear their appendage before they are cardioverted. Uh, But for other patients, 
whose atrial fibrillation is greater than or equal to 48 hours or of unknown duration, um, those patients that are having non-emergency cardioversion should be either anticoagulated for three weeks prior to their cardioversion, which is a class one recommendation, or they should be initiated on anticoagulation and have a transesophageal echo performed with kind of conditional cardioversion, assuming that there's no intracardiac clot, and that's a class 2A indication. For patients whose atrial fibrillation is less than 48 hours, known to be less than 48 hours in duration, then the recommendation is that if they have an elevated stroke risk, and that's considered a CHADS-2 VAS score of 2 in men or 3 in women, that they have initiation of anticoagulation prior to the cardioversion, which is a class 2A indication, and then they'd be continued on long-term uh, anticoagulation based on their kind of global assessment of their stroke risk and their bleeding risk, much like you would do with, with other patients. If their stroke risk is low, then anticoagulation for the cardioversion is considered optional. But that's, that's one of those areas where there's a lot of unknown. And since many of these people, even though their stroke risk is low, their bleeding risk is very low, and they're frequently going to be treated with a short course of anticoagulation. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was getting at because I've seen clinically, I, I've been told, yeah, when you after you cardiovert someone or after they get an ablation, the atria might be paralyzed and you're at increased risk of stroke for the next couple of weeks. So usually they do at least three or four weeks of an anticoagulant after that. Yeah, that's correct. And and really in general, that should be that should be your your mode of operation. Um, the, clearing the appendage is important to make sure that there's no thrombus present at the time of the cardioversion. But as you've mentioned, that atrium is actually stunned for some period of time after the cardioversion. And it's really probably related to the presence of the atrial fibrillation that is now gone. And so even though the EKG shows you normal sinus rhythm, you probably don't have normal contractile function of the appendage in the left atrium for hours to days later. And so during that period of time, there's a lot of of uh, stasis of flow in the atrial chambers. And so even if they were clear of thrombus at the time of the TEE, they may very well develop thrombus before they have return of mechanical function of the atrium after sinus rhythm is restored. And indeed, if you look at stroke risk after cardioversion, you're going to see it peak in a, within a few days of the cardioversion and then slowly taper back down to kind of baseline risk over the next one to two weeks. And so that's why we tell everybody, you know, generally almost everybody to anticoagulate for at least four weeks after the cardioversion. And that pretty well carries that patient out to the point where they're kind of back at baseline risk. Okay. So I think we're going to have to pick, uh, we definitely have to let you go very shortly here. So maybe. It's starting uh, to feel like a hostage situation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so many questions, so little time. Paul and Cyrus, yeah. why don't you each pick uh, a favorite question and then we can just, uh, th- we can we can get a take home point and, and, and get out of here. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, social media questions, but there's actually one that we talked about ahead of time that I liked a lot. Is there any sort of general counseling measures for patients with atrial fibrillation, things like avoiding caffeine or alcohol? that you do in addition to sort of the weight loss and any other general counseling for those patients? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to emphasize to the patients that much of the, of the outcome and the burden of the disease that goes along with their atrial fibrillation is subject to what they do with their lifestyle, much like the patients with coronary disease. And you all know that, 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 therapeutic lifestyle interventions are powerful interventions in patients with coronary disease. And it turns out we're seeing very similar effects in patients with atrial fibrillation. There have been a number of studies now of lifestyle intervention that have shown that that, um, the outcome in terms of maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation is highly dependent on things like improving their cardiovascular fitness, uh, modest weight loss, and then control of things like uh, hypertension and diabetes. And so absolutely patients need to be informed about that. And I would say they need to be empowered with that information so that they can make some really healthy choices that can really make a difference in whether or not they're going to be uh, really plagued by the atrial fibrillation and the cardiovascular complications that are coming from that. Um, it is important to um, to talk about alcohol use in patients with atrial fibrillation of the different triggers and things. 
I think that's probably the one that's the most important. Uh, even what we think kind of is, is modest use of alcohol can be a pretty strong trigger for atrial fibrillation in patients that are prone to AFib. And so that really needs to be emphasized with patients as part of their therapeutic lifestyle changes. Other things like caffeine consumption, I think that's probably an issue for some patients, you know, and they'll, they, they'll usually identify themselves because they've realized that when they have a strong cup of coffee, they, they get their, their palpitations and they, we find that they do have AFib. But for kind of most patients, I don't tell them they can't drink coffee or have any caffeine because there's really not a strong link across the, the whole population of patients with AFib for, with regard to uh, caffeine. Other stimulants, I think, are, should be avoided for a lot of reasons. But, uh, you know, amphetamines, obviously illicit drugs are going to have negative effects on uh, the risk for atrial fibrillation and they should be avoided. You're making a lot of friends telling people they can drink coffee with their AFib. Well, I mean, <laughs> the studies with all the mortality benefit, I mean, I, I don't, I think there's just too many arguments for it at this point. So Irish, co- <laughs> so Irish coffee, though, is maybe out the, uh, out the door. <laughs> Good points. Yeah, Eric. that's true. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Irish coffee's probably got to go. <laughs> oh, well, that's unfortunate. There so goes I, my breakfast. I, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, I did have a question, and I think this was also a question I picked up on social media from Oliver Hamilton over on Twitter. So um, kind of how do you address um, anticoagulation and treatment of atrial fibrillation if it arises in the setting of, say, critical illness or, like, you know, thyro- thyrotoxicosis? Do you approach that in the same way as uh, as kind of garden variety AFib, or is it kind of a different uh, a different treatment algorithm? Yeah, that's a really good question. I th- I think that my advice about that is to resist the urge to assign the apparently isolated episode of atrial fibrillation to a quote reversible cause. Um, I think the best way to think about it that is that most patients that go through a critical illness don't actually experience AFib, and so the ones that do. Uh, may very well have underlying disease that predisposes them to atrial fibrillation. And it's likely that atrial fibrillation is going to occur for those patients in the future. And that needs to be our kind of expectant attitude about that when we see it. Um, That particular idea of the reversibility of AFib, if you look at the different iterations of the guidelines over the years, you see that really kind of going away. And in fact, uh, the last iteration uh, said that um, while there are many, you know, kind of what we consider reversible causes, uh, that um, patients with atrial fibrillation that occurs in the setting of one of these potentially reversible conditions are rarely cured of atrial fibrillation after effective treatment or elimination of the condition. And since long-term follow-up data are not available in these clinical scenarios, and atrial fibrillation may recur, these patients receive careful follow-up. And so what that means to me is generally looking at their chads 2 vas score to kind of globally assess their risk for stroke. And most of those patients should probably be anticoagulated on the basis of that score, uh, as you would in other settings. Does this go for uh, post-op? Someone, ha- someone has a cabbage and post-op, a lot of those patients get AFib. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and you've probably effectively identified uh, one of the subgroups where we really still think of that as a reversible cause. I mean, if you've had your sternum opened and your pericardium opened and your heart cut into, then we expect to see a little bit of arrhythmia, including atrial fibrillation. And while we're actually pretty cautious about determine about following these patients and actually anticoagulating them for a short period of time, in many cases. We frequently will run extended ECG monitoring four to six weeks after their surgery. And if we don't see recurrences of atrial fibrillation in that setting, many of those patients, I would say they do sort of get a pass on that particular episode of atrial fibrillation. The one time you may also, one other time you may also see a scenario like that is in the hyperthyroid patient. So if you have a patient with Graves' disease and they're distinctly hyperthyroid and they're kind of young, and don't have a lot of other cardiovascular disease, then that's another group of patients where people starting to think that, you know, um, their, their long-term risk for recurrent atrial fibrillation once they're euthyroid and they're cured of their hyperthyroid condition may actually be pretty low. And so that's another case where you may do some extended monitoring and, and actually stop therapy. 
I think that's super helpful. And I know that um, I know that we're getting close. Uh, maybe you've exceeded our, our time here and we want to give you a chance to summarize some take home points. And maybe if there's anything in particular you wanted to plug, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. But another question, if we if we may, that came up several times on social media was regarding the use of aspirin monotherapy in kind of your low CHADS 2 VASC scores. I don't know if that's something you want to comment on. Yeah, I think that's a, another just really good point. Um, and and the question is, is there good data for aspirin, uh, particularly in patients with low stroke risk scores? And the answer is not really. There's really not good data. And the use of aspirin for stroke prophylaxis in atrial fibrillation is really waning rapidly. Uh, the idea that aspirin has efficacy is largely from the, uh, the SPAF trial, the stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation, which showed kind of a modest relative risk reduction of about 20%. But it kind of stands alone and it has some methodologic issues that have called the question even at modest degree of benefit. And so in general, uh, you're not going to see strong recommendations for aspirin for stroke prophylaxis and atrial fibrillation. And I think in general, we should think that anticoagulants and not antiplatelet drugs are needed for reduction of thromboembolism and atrial fibrillation. Outstanding. Thank you. And when was when did the SPAF trial come out about? Oh, wow. That's that's uh, you guys would consider that ancient history. I think right. it was probably in the mid to late 90s. My son refers Just using to that- context clues. The- the absence of a catchy name, I just found stunning. <laughs> like, I figured that had to be before, like, people started coming up with a catchy yeah. acronym. So someone should have been fired for that if that was recent. But that makes more sense. <laughs> so, so it looks like it was published in 1991 in circulation. Wow. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, see, it's even even older than than I remember it. But, yeah. Good Lord. Jim, like the hand-cranked cardio version. Sure. Jim, my, my, yes. my children refer to the period of my childhood, which occurred in the 1980s and 1990s as... The 1900s. They're like, they're like, <laughs> Dad. When you were growing up in the 1900s, uh, they did the SPAF trial, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's about right. But it's, <laughs> but it was, it's still, it's still useful. It, it, it served yeah. a purpose. Well, let's get, let's get a couple take home points. Or if you wanted to uh, give a plug to something, uh, go ahead. And we thank you so much for taking way more of your time than we initially asked for. Uh, Well, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to be with you on your show and congratulate you for such a successful endeavor. Uh, Main take home points, I mean, uh, I think is probably to remind everybody, but much of the care for patients with atrial fibrillation is well within the purview of the primary care clinician. And just as important that uh, to be aware of uh, treating and diagnosing AFib is to, is to be aware of the ability to prevent atrial fibrillation by uh, the things that your listeners are doing every day, attending to people's blood pressure control, talking to them about therapeutic lifestyle changes, especially weight control and inactivity, and the attention to diabetes and alcohol consumption. Um, I guess remember the goals of adequate rate control and addressing stroke prophylaxis in patients with atrial fibrillation. And uh, as straightforward as much of the care in atrial fibrillation uh, appears to be, there's still a great deal that we have yet to learn about this uh, multifaceted and extremely common uh, condition. Okay. And anything that you would like to plug? Uh, no, I mean, we've already talked about uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get started in the area of physician well-being. And I'd love to come back sometime to discuss my ongoing work around physician well-being and coaching. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of your listeners for that, uh, the tireless, sacrificial work that they're doing every day in patient care. It's hard work, uh, but it's so important. And I hope you all find meaning and purpose in what you're doing now and in the future. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Nom, nom, nom. All right. Pour one out for Stuart. (laughs) Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. 
And as you guys hopefully know, we are committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. Yes, you. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Uh, this is awkward. Uh, a special thanks to, I suppose, myself uh, for producing this. Uh, our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Cyrus Askin. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.